Great, so hello and welcome to our next webinar in the uh, Q Control series. So today we're going to be talking about how quantum computers can optimize logistics um, and improve, well, improve logistics problems. Um, so today we're going to cover a, let me stop the sharing, which apparently I don't know how to do. There we go. Stop sharing now. Just took me a second to remember how to use Zoom. Apologies, it's been a couple of months. So uh, today I'm gonna, we're gonna be discussing one of the problems we considered at Q-Control around logistics and transport um, with the Australian Army. I'm very lucky to have with me today, um, Lieutenant Colonel Marcus Doherty, who is a scientist, educator, entrepreneur, and an officer in the Australian Army. Um, Marcus, would you mind telling us a little bit more about uh, your work with Q-Control and uh, what you'd like to cover today? Yeah, sure, Michael. So I'll, I'll talk through um, who I am and what role I have within Army. Um, and so um, my job title is SO1 Quantum Technologies um, within RICO, which sits within the Future Land Warfare branch of Army, which is part of Army headquarters in Australia. And so what does all that mean? So SO1 Quantum Technology means that um, I lead Army's execution of its quantum technology roadmap, and I can talk a little bit more later about what that roadmap is. Um, RICO is the part of Army that looks after all emerging and disruptive technologies. So we're the part of Army that experiments with new technologies and tries to work out what implications they have for the future force, how we operate uh, and how we equip ourselves. Uh, and then that sits within Future Land Warfare Branch, which is then all about designing the future Army. Uh, and so they're the custodians of the design of Army. And so hopefully that helps you put where I am and then how it all fits into the bigger picture. Uh, back to you, Michael. Great. Thank you very much. And we'll get back to why quantum computing in particular is of such interest. Yeah. So and also we have um, with us today, Dr. Christopher Bentley, who is our lead so solutions engineer in particular for our quantum applications. Um, Chris, do you want to tell us a little bit more about your role at Q-Control and um, your work with this particular project. Sure. Thank you, Michael. Um, so I, I work within the solutions team, which means that I'm involved in, in different projects um, looking to apply our, our software tools in quantum computing um, in different application areas. So I'm a technical lead in different projects, particularly involving logistics and transport, um, which means that I've been working with Marcus and the Q-Control team um, looking at this this particular logistics application that we'll talk about in a bit more detail soon. Right. And um, just a reminder that I'm Michael Hush. So I am the chief scientist. Um, I've been at Q Control for six years and looking over the quantum computing and quantum sensing programs. Um, so Marcus, what was the what challenges is the army seeking to solve with quantum computing uh, today? Well, yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'll introduce a little bit about the Army's quantum technology roadmap and then lead it down to contextualise this work that we did together with uh, Q-Control. So um, Army launched its quantum technology roadmap in 2021. And so um, the purpose of that roadmap was to express Army's thinking, the direction we're going to take, how we intend to engage the technology and what is our initial guess about how this technology is going to be employed and uh, and uh, hence a prioritization of our, our efforts. Uh, core to the thesis of the roadmap was this idea that the truly disruptive applications of quantum technologies have not yet been identified. And as a result, our approach was to rapidly try to identify the military applications of quantum technology and be the first to. So that's how we sought to gain a competitive edge uh, was to be the first to identify where value lays here in quantum tech for military, and then thus allow us to prioritize our efforts to invest in the development of technology and its, its introduction capability. So we looked across all the technology domains, and we still do. Within the computing technology domain, uh, one of the first problems we, we considered was logistics. Uh, how can quantum computers help with optimizing how we perform logistics within the Australian defense? Now, this is really important to Australia because defending Australia is a grand logistical challenge. Uh, we are geographically dispersed. We have an island chain and surrounded by ocean. And so our national security is greatly dependent on our ability to actually be able to move 
things where they need to get to in order to defend us. Uh, and so uh, we tackled this in a couple of different ways. We had an initial challenge in 21 where we where Q Control responded to. Um, and then uh, we had another follow-up exploitation, what we called an exploitation project with Q Control, where we tried to refine exactly what we were looking for after that first sort of guess in 21. Uh, that led us to this idea that, hey, let's work with a really tangible problem, which is a now problem, which we have trouble with, right? Yeah. And that is um, this idea of being able to move all the things across Australia to exercise Talisman Sabre. So exercise Talisman Sabre is the very large multinational exercise that happens in Australia and its allies. The US is a, is a major contributor, Britain, Japan, and then many other countries are involved as well. And uh, typically, you know, four and a half thousand vehicles or so get moved across Australia in order to concentrate an exercise area. And it's really important that those vehicles arrive in a certain order so that the various forces can be deployed and um, can engage in the exercise in the correct order. Uh, and that, uh, you know, we seek to minimise the movement time. Uh, in times of peace, that's great for things like minimising risk to our soldiers during transport and minimising cost. In times of conflict, that's our competitive advantage is speed. So um, both of those things become super important. Um, and so uh, our interest then is, okay, we've got a tangible problem. Let's work with Q Control, assess what can quantum computing do here uh, and what are the hardware and software requirements to realise that advantage? Yeah. And when will that happen so that we in the designers of Army can start to think about, okay, well, how are we actually going to put together this massive system of Army and put quantum computing in the right place at the right time mm -hmm within this massive organism. Uh, and so that's the key things we're looking for for this engagement yeah. with Q Control. Do you mind if I just, there's that question of timing, particularly with quantum computing. Can I ask you a little bit more about um, how how you see quantum computing in terms of timing and what, uh, you're an expert in quantum computing as well, of course. So it, when it comes to the time horizons that ARMY is concerned about, um, what, what are they typically? Where do you see this fitting? And how does quantum computing fit in that timing vision? Yeah, right. So the, the way we talk about it uh, in defence, which is not unusual, is we talk about uh, 5, 10 and 15 year horizons. Right. And when we think about different quantum technologies, uh, we really place quantum sensing in the zero to five year time horizon. Yeah. So um, we think about quantum computing in its first instance between five and 10 years, and then in a, in a second evolutionary step between 10 and 15. And that's really demarked primarily between this, the types of problems that can be addressed in those two, those two time horizons with very different hardware requirements, et cetera, that are required to address different blocks and categories of problems with quantum computing. In quantum communications, um, we things like QKD is kind of a now thing, but things like networks is much more like the ten to fifteen year horizon, um, uh, and so that's that's how we think about the different technology horizons. Now, something like quantum computing is very different to quantum sensing in as much as quantum computing has to be integrated into a whole computing system mm -hmm. and a whole information network. And as a result, the integration challenge is much larger for quantum computing than it is for, say, quantum sensing, which is a component level technology, uh, which is much more limited in its integration implications. Uh, and so as a result, we know that we have to start doing stuff now in order to learn about the technology, shape the technology, understand where it can be applied and when, so that we can actually use it at its point of maturity rather than having to wait another 10 years to solve all the integration challenges in these aspects. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Um, so that yeah, that really, I think, positions both the challenge and timing for what we're now going to look in more detail. So I might hand it now over to Chris. And Chris, if you wouldn't mind presenting a bit more on the particular challenge we considered and what we discovered when we examined that optimal, the logistics problem. I'll start with you. Sure thing. Thanks, Michael.
There we go. That should be showing. Yep. Yeah. Go for it. Wonderful. Okay. So Marcus, thanks for setting up the problem um, so wonderfully. Um, as, as Marcus has introduced, we were looking with the army at a very concrete scenario, uh, which is a now problem uh, with particular challenges to do with moving large numbers of vehicles and equipment and personnel, um, in particular to a training area in Queensland. Um, so here we're looking at deployment of convoys from Townsville and Brisbane um, towards this particular training area, uh, somewhere in between them, Shoalwater Bay training area. Um, there are different route options. There are different constraints about how to get there. Um, this movement on the roads is a personnel risk. So this is something that Marcus identified um, and, and we were provided by Army these, these particular objectives for this scenario. Um, and reducing the risk is a key objective uh, for what we're trying to do with our quantum computing optimization. And the other aspect is the operational risk. So making sure that the right people, the right personnel, the right equipment and, and vehicles are arriving at the right place at the right times. Um, so the timing of this deployment is also a key objective. Um, so looking at a little bit more detail in at these, we've got the aim of determining the optimal departure times for these convoys um, and their route allocations to reach this training area, um, minimizing the movement time, minimizing the risks. We've got particular constraints to do with the target arrival sequence um, and constraints to do with which vehicles, for instance, the heavy vehicles can't travel across small bridges um, and they can't travel on small roads. Um, and then we need to also incorporate the dynamic elements of the situation. So you, you have the congestion uh, from civilian traffic. You also have congestion that's generated from previous convoy deployments. Um, if you're deploying a lot of these vehicles along the same routes, then you have this buildup of congestion that it will impact the time it takes for everything to reach the, the target destination. Um, so these are all aspects of the problem that we needed to build in. One of the key questions for, for looking at a quantum computing approach to these problems is how hard is it to solve using current methods or using classical normal computers? Um, often or typically these logistics type problems are, are hard to solve, um, meaning, that, uh, meaning more specifically that you have an exponential scaling in the runtime with the size of these problems. So here we benchmarked the routing problem for this exercise talisman saber deployment, where we looked at scaling up the number of convoys to be deployed and choosing the best routes for these convoys. So looking for the optimal solution um, and to solve this problem, it was requiring exponentially increasing time to find that best solution. Um, and if you extrapolate that scale, you can see that when you reach around 120 convoys, um, you're needing roughly a month of computing time. Um, depending on, on the classical computing resources you, you bring to bear, but a month is just too long, even for a planning exercise for, for a long lead time. Often you're, you're playing with the specific parameters um, and you want it to be much less than a day in practice um, or as, as fast as it can be. So what's typically used for this type of problem in industry or, or in different settings are heuristic methods where you trade the solution quality. So you move away from the optimal solution um, and you provide a solution faster where you know that it's not going to be optimal. And so there's, there's this boundary or trade-off with these heuristic methods of um, what's the gap in quality from the optimal and how much faster can you actually obtain this solution. Um, and so this is the particular gap um, in quality and runtime that we're hoping um, and expecting that quantum computing can, can address this gap and provide what's called quantum advantage, um, faster or better solutions. So now we come to the algorithm design. How do we set up this problem with the given constraints so that it can actually address the key objectives and constraints and provide useful solutions uh, to the Australian army? Um, we were looking at a quantum approximate optimization algorithm, QAOA, um, as, as the framework for our quantum computing approach. This is a promising near-term approach uh, in the sense that it uses fewer uh, 
smaller scale devices and it uses the quantum resources um, in partnership with classical resources. So you're spreading, you're sp spreading the computational load across classical or normal computers and the quantum computers in what you're aiming for as the most effective way. Um, and there's technical uncertainty in this approach um, as quantum computing is still an emerging technology. Um, and so our approach at Q-Control is to understand where this gap is that I talked about. So the opportunities for advantage, what scale of problem do we need to tackle to be able to see this advantage? What scale of quantum computer would we need to address this type of problem? So how big does it need to be? How long do the calculations need to run for on these devices? Um, and then as we understand the target size of these calculations, we can then look at staged testing approaches. So as the quantum hardware improves and as the quantum software improves to get the best performance, um, we can then perform these tests of the algorithm and, and the hardware at different scales and assess where we sit with regard to this target gap um, to make sure that we're on track and addressing the key open questions um, and if there are any risks to identify them early. So here I've got a couple of uh, figures showing the way that we, we've designed the algorithm to spread the computing load for, for maximum performance um, and also to provide practical full-scale solutions with current computing, with current quantum computers. Um, so on the left-hand side, we've got the division of the deployment time optimization, which we can treat with a classical optimizer wrapped around a quantum optimization of the roots. So for the, the, the deployment optimization, we care about when the convoys are deployed and which routes they take or, and And so this is a way to decompose the problem, um, which means that we can, we have these this hardware optimized application solvers, um, which are geared around fitting larger scale problems now onto smaller co quantum computers using our quantum resources more effectively. Um, then on the right hand side, we have convoy clustering. And this is another way to decompose the problem where we know this target arrival sequence of the convoys at the destination, the training area. Um, and so we can use a heuristic to group these convoys into clusters and perform this optimization over these groups of convoys um, as different pieces of the calculation on the quantum computer that we then fit together to form the large scale solution um, at the end. Once we have the algorithm designed, the next thing is how do we get the best performance out of the quantum hardware uh, when we want to deploy this calculation? Um, and so here we're using Q-Control's core software, which is quantum infrastructure software um, designed to make quantum useful. So here it's error reduction, um, trying to reduce the errors that are intrinsic to any quantum hardware um, through infrastructure software to extract the best possible performance. Um, you can see this depiction of the quantum technology stack on the right-hand side there, where we've highlighted logistics optimization. So this is the quantum algorithm and application. Um, given the, the algorithm design, we want to deploy it through to the hardware, which sits at the bottom of the stack. And we've got these purple layers highlighted, which is where, where Q-Control's um, infrastructure software sits um, and reduces the error through quantum error correction, through hardware-aware quantum compilation, through quantum firmware, like optimization of the laser pulses or uh, microwave pulses or whatever it might be on the device. Just making sure that the way that the algorithm is sent, sent to the device, the quantum computer itself, um, provides the best possible performance. And we can look at the impact of this infra infrastructure software on the hardware performance. Um, this is a benchmark optimization problem. Um, so applying QA away, the same optimization algorithm that we're looking at for deployment here on a benchmarking graph problem. So op optimizing um, the treatment of this graph that you can see on the left-hand side there. Um, this is called a max cut problem. And when you take, uh, if, if you just randomly sample or brute force solutions and sample and, and check the probability of obtaining solutions with different quality. Um, this gives you the red curve on the left-hand side. When you apply the quantum optimization using our infrastructure software, you have this enhancement in quality 
over this red curve, which looks very similar to what you'd get if you simply deploy the algorithm on, on the bare metal hardware without error reduction. Um, so with the infrastructure software, you move to this purple curve on the right-hand side, um, which is high quality solutions with high probability. And we find the optimal solution in this case. So um, this is a very nice demonstration of the impact of reducing errors on the hardware to actually find the optimal solution in this case um, with 70 qubits, which is a nice um, large scale test. So now the question is, how, how does this, how does our quantum algorithm perform um, moving back to this deployment problem that we've been talking about? Um, so here on the left-hand side, you've got again the map of the scenario. We have these um, origins at Townsville and Brisbane, and we're moving these convoys to, to the target destination at Shoalwater Bay training area. On the right-hand side, you have this, this solution using a quantum computer. Um, which we've obtained using our algorithm. So you can see we've found the deployment times for each of the convoys, um, which are sorted going up the y-axis in, in terms of their departure order. You can see the, the routes which the convoys are deployed on, um, optimized by our algorithm. And uh, you can see the different durations based on how long it takes um, on the x-axis. So this is showing half of the solution effectively, the first of two days of deployment for this large scale exercise. Um, and it works, right? So we, we find these deployment solutions. Um, the convoys are arriving in the target order um, that's specified according to ARMY's um, target arri arri arrival order. Um, we can compare it with a, a fairly basic classical heuristic called a greedy heuristic. Um, which is simple, simple to set up, but very fast to run, where you say for each of the convoys deployed in turn, what's the best route to deploy it on um, to arrive in the right order and, and for the best, for the fastest deployment time. Um, so this, this is a benchmark which is known to not be optimal, as in it's going to be impacted from, it's going to be impacted by congestion in a way that, um, each of your decisions should consider the future convoys to be deployed, which is what makes this problem hard. And here you're just making the decision locally. You're saying, given what we've had in the past, what's the best decision? Um, the challenge is that configuring um, state-of-the-art heuristics, which, which include this full problem context, um, is more challenging. And that's something that ARMY did perform um, separately from Q-Control. Um, and a carefully configured state-of-the-art classical heuristic like this should be faster for this problem size. We're not claiming quantum advantage here. We haven't reached the gap where we expect the quantum heuristic to win over all classical algorithms. But the performance of our, our quantum algorithm is such that we, we do expect to see a quantum advantage with, with larger problems. Um, we, we've had positive re results at this scale. And as the scale continues to grow, um, we're closing, we're getting closer to this gap of advantage, which is why um, this is a promising direction. And we're also very pleased with the two hours saved over the greedy classical heuristic. So this um, benchmark algorithm we compared with um, is much, much inferior to the quantum algorithm that, that we were exploring. So if we look at the performance of the quantum component itself, um, we we're able to solve two times larger problems by using our infrastructure software. So on the left-hand side, um, you can see with as the problem size grows, because we're looking at an approximate algorithm, um, we expect the probability of obtaining the optimal solution um, to be exponentially hard. And so this ideal curve is decreasing. It's harder to find the optimal solution. Um, and then on the hardware itself, we move below this ideal curve with perfect hardware because the hardware has errors and the Q control curve stays closer to this ideal solution. Um, and it's still beating random sampling from, from this final optimized circuit up to 10 qubits, um, where if you just do the bare metal deployment, this only occurs up to five qubits. Um, so it's showing this two times larger effective optimization performance. Um, I should also say that this these results are from um, 
early to mid last year. And since then, we've we've had superior results on the hardware, both from hardware development and, and the software development, um, which has led to these 70 qubit um, optimization results that I showed. Um, so we're excited to test this out with, um, with the newer hardware and the newer software as well. On the right-hand side, we can see a six-time improvement in the runtime to reach an optimal solution. So based on the probability of obtaining the best deployment solution, we can find how long we expect to run quantum calculations to reach that solution. Um, and we see a six times speed up. So the key takeaway here is reducing hardware errors is critical, both for improving the solution quality um, and the runtime on, on the quantum computer. So uh, in terms of the outcomes for, for this partnership and investigation, um, we're looking at enabling near-term deployment optimization. So we found um, using our infrastructure software, we've, we found dramatic improvements in, in the deployment to the quantum hardware. So 12 times reduction in, in the errors. Um, we can uh, solve two times larger problems on the quantum hardware at a time. And the runtime to reach optimal is six times faster based on both um, the reduction in the circuit duration through our infrastructure software, but also the reduction in errors. So each circuit is more effective um, on the device itself. So this, uh, this partnership with ARMY is shown here in the top left, um, looking at the safe, efficient movement, uh, movement support plans for deployment. We've also worked in a variety of other areas, looking at logistics and transport optimization problems with different partners. Um, and it's a very promising area that we're excited to keep, keep pursuing. So I will bounce back to Michael now, but yes, please contact us if you have any questions. Please ask any technical questions or details um, to understand some more of these results. Thank you, Chris. And on the topic of questions, so Henry's already discovered this, but if you have any further questions, please enter them into the Q&A. So there's just a button on your Zoom interface which says Q&A. Add the questions right now or whenever you want, and we'll get to answering them in a second. Um, to start, I wanted to touch upon like the choice of the problem with logistics. So, so Mark, as you mentioned, I think at the beginning, did you go into this project expecting quantum computing to have an advantage in logistics? Um, and like, where, where did that intuition come from? Or is that something you learned through this collaboration? Yeah, so <clears throat> the um, uh, to talk through more of the background here. So in mm -hmm. 2021, we had a thesis, which was, hey, we think, you know, quantum computing has got something to do with optimization, right? So <laughs> Uh, we went, okay, well then, uh, what are the sorts of big optimization problems that we have in Army, um, which are ones which we can um, we can really engage in and, and these sorts of things um, publicly. And so logistics was a was an obvious choice. We began with um, the um, one of the the bottom left hand corner that Chris had on his his penultimate slide, which was, okay, last mile resupply. Let's think forward to the future, which is, oh, we're going to have uh, various sorts of unmanned uh, ground vehicles, which are going to be resupplying force elements in combat. It's going to be a very dynamic, very difficult problem to be able to navigate and pack and schedule and navigate all of those vehicles to the, the, the force elements as they're fighting. That was a great problem. It was cool but it didn't have the, it, we couldn't get a good answer about where advantage would lie in that because there was too much that was still speculative about that problem and there wasn't enough reality to it. Um, and so that then is what led us to then this movement problem, which is, okay, instead of thinking about coolness, let's think about what is actually a real problem we have today, which we struggle with. And so that's then led us to exercise talisman saver as being, hey, this is it. Okay, let's see what quantum can do here. And in parallel to you guys, we contracted any, uh, a, a, a well-established uh, major industrial player that does logistics optimization using classical compute. Um, and we ran you two guys in uh, parallel. And the good news is you guys came to the same answers. Um, so the classical benchmarking that Chris presented 
uh, is consistent with the classical benchmarks that that other major company um, provided us. Um, there was different things that they showed us, which is then around, okay, well, how do you actually integrate an optimization software like this into a logistics system? Uh, and so that really then posits us, that, that, that poses what's the next steps for Army? Um, uh, and so uh, I can talk more about that, Michael, or I might hand back to you. Okay, I'll just um, make a comment around that as well. I just want to talk about the benefit from projects like this. And so certainly from our perspective at Q Control, I wanted to really highlight that the, the specificity in the problem that we looked at, like the ordering component, was really, really revealing to us about it, it by being targeted in what optimization problem you're looking at, it can really change the nature of when uh, a quantum algorithm would be relevant. So just a general comment to everyone out there, there are significant benefits on really considering real problems that make a difference for your business or your particular activity you're looking for, both in the sense of, of course, it's better aligned with what outcomes you want, but also on the quantum side, you'll get a much clearer understanding of these algorithms um, and when they will be relevant. So uh, around that, I just wanted to ask you, Chris, like what was one of the uh, most important things you learned during this project? And in particular, like where did you find that the quantum computer gave you the best advantage and our aerosuppressant technology, like how did that have an effect on solving this problem? I think there were, there were lots of parts to that question, but uh, <laughs> I think, some, something that struck me was uh, these problems, these practical problems, which are hard in, in real scenarios. Um, often there's not an off-the-shelf solution which addresses the key objectives and constraints. It takes some design to actually treat it properly and provide solutions that, that are meaningful in the setting. Um, this is true both for the quantum case and for, for normal uh, solvers. Um, and so this, this was a key piece of what we tackled in the algorithm design um, component. How do we separate the, the normal computer and the quantum resources? How do we make sure that we can use current quantum devices to provide deployment solutions at scale, fitting these pieces together in a sensible way um, that provide actually high quality deployment solutions um, for, for large numbers of convoys? Um, so I think that that was something that struck me that if you set up this problem, um, it's so important to set the problem up well um, in any case. And then once you do that, you can really pursue how does the, the quantum hardware perform from that point. Um, then when it comes to the quantum infrastructure software you flagged, Michael, um, the, the error reduction was key. You saw with the, the data that I showed from the hardware tests, if you just run on the hardware without thinking about the intrinsic error on the quantum devices, um, it doesn't take many convoys or doesn't take many qubits before you're seeing essentially random results. So if you want to perform effective optimization, you need to be pushing down these errors in any means possible. And, and this is the core work at Q-Control is precisely this. How can we push these errors down as low as we can so that we get the useful results from the quantum hardware? Um, and we're pushing on all these avenues at all the layers of the technology stack saying, where can we, where can we win? Where can we enhance this performance out of yeah. current devices? Yeah. And I just wanted to like say that that's so important because if you're running this project to learn about where quantum computing will have an effect, if you don't use the state of the art error suppression technology, like we provide a Q control, um, you won't get the right answer. You'll think that quantum computers aren't as relevant as they actually are. So it's just really critical to use error suppression technology that we provide through Fireable or embedded technology on IBM to remove those errors so you understand the true performance of what these quantum computers can provide. Um, so one last question before we um, look at some of the questions being submitted by our, our attendees. Um, Marcus, given this learning from this project, where, where is ARMY looking now? Where are you looking forward for how quantum computing can help and change the way you operate? Yeah, so um, uh, so what was the what was really achieved in this project was um, a set of trusted results and predictions. So uh, if I hopefully I get the numbers correct, the final conclusion here was that advantage lays 
somewhere in the region of 120 convoys. Um, and um, you guys gave us an estimate of what are the core hardware metrics that we should look out for uh, that would actually deliver that advantage at that number of convoys. Um, and uh, that was taking into account the error suppression techniques and software that you have. Um, and so that then goes, uh, that combined with the fact that an independent established industrial player and optimization validated your key benchmarks, gave us trust that, okay, we've got something here. We've got a, a reasonably accurate prediction and a reasonable set of requirements that we can now base our planning on. So that has now created uh, essentially a stimulus within defence uh, where I'm now meeting with people across defence and talking about, okay, well, what does our actual solution for logistics optimization look like across the different horizons? Uh, and um, what is our current plan for that very large system of technologies that are brought together to do that? and then position quantum computing in it and design the next projects, which will then be targeted at not only is it does it do something worthwhile, but can it meet the constraints that are required to introduce it into that that tech, that future technology system, which is to do logistics optimization. So that's where we are. That's the value of the project delivered. And that's now where we are uh, in what we've been doing next. Yeah. And, and when you say constraints, I guess you're also speaking to like how you would actually get the quantum computing information on the field as well, not just the performance of the algorithm. Is that fair to say? That's right. So what is the full concept of employment here? Are we going to have um, a quantum computer in the bunker under a mountain somewhere? Uh, and how does that, how would that then plug into something? Or are we going to deploy it in various operational headquarters and these sorts of things? So that's the hardware bit. And then there's all the mm -hmm. software and information uh, communication aspects to it as well. Um, and as Chris was talking also, if we're not just thinking about one problem, multiple problems, how do we actually get all of that problem contextualization specification then mapped through? And that's not just quantum computing, that's a whole lot of classical steps which are then involved in doing that as well. And how do we actually get all of that to work together? Excellent. Um, so moving now to some questions from the audience. So uh, Nicholas asked, this is building on this question of um, this threshold for quantum advantage. So Chris, how many convoys would you need to schedule to claim some form of quantum advantage? I think I know the answer is 120 on that then, but then how many qubits would you need to achieve this for you, Chris? It's so, so 120 is the number where we said, this is where it takes about a month of computing time. We used a cluster for these benchmarks for the exact solver. So saying, it's going to take this long to compute the exact solution at this scale. To find, because we're using a quantum approximate solver, there's a bit more nuance there. Um, we want to address this gap in, in runtime or performance with the state-of-the-art approximate solvers classically. Um, we want to beat the best solvers that are, are comparable um, without using a quantum computer to give quantum advantage. That's when it would make sense to use the quantum computer in practice. Um, and to determine this gap, this is where you need to intersect this work. So Marcus mentioned this other partner who was investigating what's the state of the art classical method, what's the scale that you need, um, or what 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 are these runtime performance trade offs that identify this region? Um, for this type of problem, typically the scale is several hundred qubits, um, as far as we've determined from our benchmarking in related problems. So several hundred qubit, uh, sorry, several hundred, yeah, several hundred qubits is is fairly standard. If you think about the number of convoys for this specific problem, um, it's on the order of a hundred convoys. You'd need to compare with the details from from the the classical heuristics results. I'd expect a hundred, maybe a couple of hundred convoys before the heuristic starts to struggle and this gap grows in in meaning or value to army. And that's where we where, where we want to hit. Um, a broader question to you, Marcus, is um, what are some other industries or applications that can benefit from similar logistics improvements today? Um, do you have any comments about do you see the broader opportunity? 
Um, so um, there's obviously other transport sectors that could benefit from this, um, and you guys can comment more about that. I think if you think these sorts of canonical problems, which are around scheduling and routing, um, there's this is ubiquitous across lots of things. Everything from the orientation um, uh, and management of a constellation of satellites through to communications, uh, through to um, various other various other things from warehouse management and this sort of stuff. So I think the problems here are, are, are reasonably canonical, and that is that you, you'll see them the same problem repeated in various industries. It really comes down to when does the scale make sense? And as Chris was talking about, when is good enough okay and when is when is perfection required and so um that then depends on uh is the optimization and gaining an edge over competitors in optimization critical to you or do you just need good enough and it will be okay for your for your business yeah absolutely yeah i just second that um you really the, the nice thing about logistics problems is particularly in a commercial setting they often affect your bottom line. So what, what it's worth always doing when you begin these engagements is figuring out how big of an impact would that have to make sure that you're positioning quantum computing where it's facing the biggest opportunity where it will really make a big difference. So developing these right benchmarks is really critical. And it was great to see that alignment between the project that Q-Control ran and this other, uh, other company you consulted with around this initial setting of the problem. Um, so just a broader question maybe then to both of you around um, the design, et cetera. So um, how did the, so how did basically the, 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 the constraints on the convoys as in the bounds and um, the other constraints that you put into place, how did that affect the approach to the algorithm design? Um, or did you find that just using QAOA in general is robust and regardless to the constraints that you had? Um, so the constraints make a big difference to, to the choice of algorithm or to the way that you set up the algorithm. Um, something that's nice about this QAOA, this quantum approximate optimization algorithm is, um, it's quite a powerful framework. So you can use this framework, um, but then the way that you implement it depends a lot on, on the details of the constraints and the way that you, uh, you deal with these constraints will impact the the length of the calculation on the device and the uh, the scale of calculation that you can perform in practice. And there are different ways that you can approach these these constraint implementations. Um, these are really important decisions for for getting the best performance. And the details um, in in sometimes a very frustrating way when it comes down to to this design process, these constraints make a big impact on what's going to be resource efficient, which problems are actually tractable um, in the near term and which ones are more in that 10 to 15 year bucket that Marcus mentioned. Um, and something that, that has been nice about this problem is we've had this array of constraints of different types, um, but we've managed to design both these classical and quantum approaches to fit them together uh, to make sure that the, the solutions were fitting fitting for the use case. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess like in a simpler explanation, you know, the more constraints you have typically, the deeper the circuit, right? So, so first and foremost, you want to be using Q control error suppression technology to do the deepest circuit you can. But then on top of that, um, yeah, if certain optimization problems can be very challenging because of the length of the quantum circuit that has to be executed. Right? Um, I think there's a common theme that is kind of coming through with these questions. So I might ask this one. It's a bit of a repetition, but I'll like give you both a chance to kind of answer it again. So um, yeah, what type of optimization problem is best suited to a quantum approach? And um, at what scale, again, like in terms of what scale would you begin to see a advantage over existing classical solutions? I guess like the big question we all keep asking ourselves, I'll, I'll give you both a chance to respond to that one. Uh, so I'll leave the I'll leave the the detail to Chris to talk through. I, I think one approach that we took with this what when we're thinking through things is um, don't try to make fast things faster. 
So if you've mm. already got a fast solution, which is fitting um, what you needed to do, a quantum computer won't help you. It's rather looking for things which are currently intractable or things yeah. which uh, uh, you just don't do, right? Um, and so as a result, um, this is a this this um, uh, this particular problem is a good one. Now, what do I mean by that? The way we do things at the moment is that we just apply massive fudge factors or safety factors when we do logistics planning in order to reduce risk of failure. What that means is that the current solutions we have are far from optimal in terms of speed and uh, and efficiency, but they get the job done in a way that we can rely on it now. That's great, again, in a peacetime setting, but when you're fighting for advantage, the speed becomes super important, right? So um, that's why we need to engage with technologies like this in order to make those things that we currently just don't do uh, much better uh, in a, in, and employ it fundamentally different, if get a fundamentally different tool to allow us to do these things at this scale. So over to you, Chris. Yep, I'm I'm totally on the same page there. So we've we've talked a, a bit about the different criteria that we look at for these problems to say this this one's suitable to really push hard on um, for near term or for longer term quantum computing. So one of these things is the value of the problem. Um, you want a an improvement, um, whether it's an incremental improvement if you're looking in the near term or um, potential uh, proven theoretical speed up at scale if you're looking in the longer term um, to have meaningful impact on your bottom line, on your safety of your operation, um, whatever it might be. So the value of addressing that gap of current optimization approaches um, needs to be something meaningful to you. It needs to be a hard problem to solve as it is. This is what Marcus was just saying. If it's something that's already efficient to solve, um, then there's not a great deal of point. Um, but if, if as you scale this problem, you see something like this exponential change in the runtime of the calculation, um, that's where a speed up of a completely different approach using quantum computing um, can really add value. Um, the other aspect is the resource efficiency. So particularly for these nearer term applications where we're saying, what can we do soon with quantum computers? You want to think about how how long is the runtime on the device going to be? Because this impacts the errors on the calculation. How many qubits am I going to need? So what scale of quantum computer would I need to actually solve hard problems? And this is where you're saying, given, given this hard scale of problem with current solvers, what do we need in terms of quantum devices now to tackle that same scale? Um, and is that a reasonable expectation in terms of hardware roadmaps, software roadmaps? Um, in the quantum industry. So when it comes to the, the practical settings, this is why um, combinatorial optimization problems being the, the mathematical term, but classes of problems like in logistics, so scheduling and routing, um, facility location is another one. This type of problem is hard to solve and often fits these criteria in a way that's promising in the near term. Um, yeah, and I just wanted to... I, I really just want to reemphasize that both of you said, find real problems that make a difference. Don't try and start with things which are already got a good solution. Um, and then the other thing I just wanted to add is like, uh, I, there is this, sometimes there's this notion of quantum computers are good at big data. It's That's not the case. It's just the first thing I immediately want to take here. It's, I'd like to think about it more as um, quantum computers are good at big problems. So you're typically, you're not looking at cases where you're feeding in a huge amount of data into your optimization problem and you're limited by the data input. That's just, I just wanted to highlight that's not necessarily where you want to be. The problems that we've all been talking about today are much more like um, you've got some basic information about your problem setting, which is efficient in terms of how much is there, but then the problem space, the number of combinations and the number of possibilities that you have to consider is extremely large. And that's what takes so long for these solvers to get from A to B um, when you're trying to optimize logistics problem. Uh, so one more um, problem from the, one more question from the audience and then I'll, I'll finish with one from me. So uh, for Chris, what quantum error correction techniques 
was used to improve, um, well, what QEC technique was used to improve the performance of the algorithms that were run? Yeah, so there, there's different terminology in the quantum sector, um, and I'm not sure where, where you're coming from in, in specific background here, but um, there, there are different ways to reduce errors across the technology stack. And quantum error correction can sometimes refer to a specific way of, for instance, encoding um, multiple physical qubits onto logical qubits. So, um, and and specific algorithms around reducing errors in this way. Um, we didn't do this. We were using the physical qubits on the device, um, and the error reduction techniques that we use go across the stack. Um, so this includes things like compiling the circuit. So you take this set of instructions for the calculation um, and you compress it as far as you can um, in a way that reduces how long this thing needs to run on the quantum computer because that's a way to reduce the errors. But you don't want to just compress it like that because you also want to think about which, which of the, the physical qubits on the device, which of these pieces of the device interact worse with each other than others. And so this affects the way that you put these blocks of the calculation together. Um, and this is a very challenging problem, um, which makes it fun for us as quantum physicists to try and tackle in an effective way. Um, but this is a key piece of reducing the errors. Another example is error mitigation, which is the way that you measure the results out of the device and correct for the known biases um, from the hardware. This is something that the way you deal with it um, is very important for getting the best results from the hardware. One of our, um, an, an important note here, I think, is there are ways to do this that don't scale well with the problem, um, that just become increasingly expensive as you move to um, larger scale problems and practical and relevant scales. And you need to be really careful that, that the techniques that you use can handle large scale problems. So this is also a, a core piece of what we need to think about in bringing down these errors. Yeah, and just to then mention also the connection with quantum error correction, which is the specific technique. So everything that we build at Q-Control is completely compatible with improving quantum error correction. So the error suppression technology that Chris mentioned boosts the probability of a quantum error correction protocol of giving the correct error. Um, but just at this moment, quantum error correction doesn't give a benefit when used on devices. So stay tuned, but like when quantum error correction gives a benefit, you'll see it incorporated into our, our technology stack as well. So just, um, just sort of finishing off with, I know there was one last question around uh, how can organizations evaluate logistics use cases without requiring hands-on support from Q-Control? I'll just grab that one quickly. I would say if you do have your own optimization problem, which you want to handle now, you can use our error suppression technology through Fire Opal or our embedded solution on IBM. Um, and that will give you a real understanding of how that logistics problem will work with the real state of the art uh, quantum computing technology that's available. So that, that's one way of also directly tackling the logistics problems without um, without engaging us in the professional services side by just using our uh, solutions which are available off the shelf today. Um, so I just wanted to finish with uh, one question. So the, the question that I think, again, timing has been a thing with everything. So the unfair question I would, would be tempted to ask is when do you, be, when do you both believe quantum advantage is going to arrive? But since you're both scientists, I'll, I'll, I'll spin it a different way and ask, um, in your experience, you've both been working in the quantum computing and quantum technology sector a, a while. Can you speak to the improvements you've seen um, from your past when you started and where you see the technology today? Um, just to also give the audience a, a, at least sort of from a perspective as a scientist, you can speak very truthfully to that experience and also let everyone know how that quantum computing technology is improving. Yeah, um, I'll pass that over to you, Marcus. Yeah, thanks, Michael. So I'll uh, I'll speak truthfully, which is don't ask don't ask a bunch of physicists what to do with a quantum computer. So mm -hmm. that has been my experience over the last five years, right? And that is ask people who do computing about how they're going to use a quantum computer and help them come to grips with the the characteristics, limitations, and and these other things of this new computing technology. So what have I seen over the last five years? 
there has been a movement where people have from various disciplines have actually engaged with quantum computing. And I believe that is really accelerating. That's really accelerating the, uh, the identification where this technology is useful and is guiding the development of the technology, right? So that's, that's the faith I have in the future, uh, right? And so uh, I really think that we should all be prepared for surprises. And I think there will be surprises potentially within five years um, about quantum computing actually being used in anger in some sort of application mm -hmm. and delivering value, but much more likely the, the, the first initial applications will happen in that five to 10 year bracket. And those surprises are going to be generated by some dude out there going, oh my God, I can actually use this thing to make this widget go much better. And it requires a lot less uh, complexity than we had previously thought for this particular niche application. So that's why I have faith that the more interdisciplinary people get involved in doing this, we're going to actually get surprises in the near term. Yeah. Uh, but then those sort of more flagship applications are happening more towards that that 10 year mark. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I totally agree. There's been a much better alignment between business and um, the actual use of quantum computers over the last five years. It's been a really important transformation. Uh, Chris, do you have a comment from your perspective as well? Um, I, I think I'm pretty much on the same page as Marcus there. Um, it's been exciting to see a growing engagement with from the application side, uh, which is which is where I'm working on how can we use this for practical problems? What's it going to mean in practice to use a quantum computer? Um, and how can we aim towards providing that value from the quantum sector? So that interface is is expanding in, in an exciting way. Um, in terms of progress in the sector, I think um, it's hard to, to remember precisely to what happened each year, but we've gone from demonstrations of very small scale algorithms with just a few qubits. Um, and now just recently, we've got these 70 and more qubit optimization problems, um, which are being performed successfully where you're finding th these optimal results. Um, and that's hugely exciting. Like seeing that rate of growth has been a surprise to me. Yeah. And yeah, and just from some perspective, and that's been happening over the last six years. So that, that progress has been really considerable in terms of the quality of qubits, the combination of the error suppression technology and the ability to hit the algorithms for 70 plus. Um, yeah, excellent. So thank you both for coming to this webinar and um, really appreciate your insights, both in the applications of quantum computing and the opportunity in the context of logistics problems for the Australian Army. Thank you both very much. See you, everybody.